Sarah's online. You have to turn your volume down. Good morning. Hi. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, I would like to call the Car Carlisle Regional School uh, DEIB committee meeting to order. And we're going to call to order by roll call because Sarah's online. Mr. Booth, we can start with you. <laughs> uh, Morano present for both. Rankin, Rankin present for both. Quinn present for region. Wilson present for region. All right. So we are going to start out with public comment and we will start in the room first. Uh, we have a time limit of three minutes for a public comment. If you would like to make a public comment and you have a blue sheet, you can hand it to me. And if you are online, if you can use the raise hand feature, we will get you on that. Yeah, I don't see any in the room. Our, our, um... Robin Rowe, the dean at Concord Academy, was going to speak. Um, he's supposed to be here. I'll, I'll just go. Maybe he's online because we start with public comment and then we'll move on. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So I see none in the room. Anyone online? No. All right. And we are moving on. So we are ready to start a discussion. And Andrew is with us today to give us his DEIB progress report for the 2022 2023 school year. We're excited to have you here with us. I think this is our fourth and final meeting of this year, so we can see everything that's been happening. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me here uh, this morning. I'm going to share my screen at this moment, and we'll get started. Hey, I think that looks good. So again, I think the focus, again, the focus of this meeting is really um, to give an end of the year report on all of the DEIB related um, initiatives that we've been able to accomplish this year. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide, um, in this uh, slideshow presentation, uh, so bear with me. Um, so the agenda for today, again, talk about how you know how we got here um, i'm going to give a quick overview of our district-wide strategic plan our professional development paths uh, our deib strategic plan and of course the equity audit that was completed uh, back in january of this year i'm also going to give an overview of what we did accomplish this year um, so some deib progress monitoring uh, information there. And then looking ahead to next year, I will share some DEIB uh, initiatives for the 2023-2024 school year. And then I, of course, I will end with some uh, end of the year events that are uh, upcoming. So how did we get here? So of course, many of you know, uh, we have a uh, pretty comprehensive uh, district-wide strategic plan. Uh, strand three of that of that strategic plan is focused on our strategic objective on inclusive culture. And, you know, I looked over the objective there and really wanted to just highlight um, some of the key words that you will find in that objective. Um, so a strong focus on inclusive culture, a strong focus on how we value and embrace diversity. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, focus on cultural responsive curriculum. Uh, there's focus on cultural uh, proficiency through our professional development paths for our educators. And then, of course, our focus on equity, uh, making sure that the needs of all of our diverse students are met. And then, of course, accountability for uh, sustaining this work uh, of, for the foreseeable future. In terms of uh, our professional development paths. Again, we have a pretty comprehensive uh, PD framework here in Concord. Um, just right at the top is some statistics uh, based on this year's participation. Uh, we saw an 84% participation from our educators, particularly our faculty, who all participated in various uh, DEIB-related uh, PD paths. Um, more specifically, out of 15 professional development PD paths, there were 10 PD paths that were focused on DEIB. And some of uh, some of the examples there, uh, we had a PD path focused on African American and uh, abolitionist and the story of Concord. We had a PD path focused on instructional practices to support equity for all learners. Uh, we had a PD path focused on choosing and using inclusively diverse literature. 
And then, of course, our longstanding professional development path, the ideas course, um, the anti-racist uh, school practices, uh, which is facilitated by Dr. Paula Martin, who's our our district cultural competency consultant, and then Ed Bryan, who is an ideas instructor. And then this image here on the left, I think many of you all have seen from uh, Kristen Anderson, our assistant superintendent of teaching and learning who oversees professional development. Uh, this, this, this visual here really outlines all the PD offerings that we provide to our educators. So in terms of our five-year DEIB strategic plan, again, last year was my first year in the role as director of DEIB. And so strong uh, focus was, was really to get our community, our school community, our educators, our support staff, our administrators, school committee, um, really to, to have a shared understanding and commitment uh, of DEIB across all of our schools, right? And so this visual here on the left really defines what we mean by diversity, what we mean by equity, what we mean by inclusion, and of course, belonging. Over to the right is our DEIB strategic plan, which I uh, implemented going into this 2023, 2020, uh, 2022, 2023 school year. And within our DEIB strategic plan, uh, we have six priority areas uh, and of course associated objectives. Those priority areas include uh, professional development, a focus on school culture, cultural responsive curriculum and equitable uh, inclusive classroom, student and family engagement, hiring, mentoring, and retention, and of course, uh, being transparent in our communication of our DEIB values, and of course, institution accountability um, is embedded in there as well. Earlier in uh, this past January, we completed our uh, two-year uh, process of the, of the uh, equity audit. And of course, our consultants, uh, Dr. Khalees Warnham and Dr. Carol Blake, led us through this equity audit. Uh, some of the findings and recommendations are noted on this slide, uh, but more specifically, our recommend, uh, the recommendations uh, provided by Dr. Warnham and Dr. Blake included um, hiring and diversity, METCO and BIPOC students, professional development, family and community engagement, and student engagement. What you would notice within these recommendations is that each of these recommendations actually align closely to five out of the six priority areas in the DEIB strategic plan. And so again, I think, um, you know, when you look through the equity audit finance, which you can find right on our district website under the DEIB tab, uh, you can learn a lot more about some of the findings and recommendations and, of course, some of the data that Dr. Warnham and Dr. Blake collected. So in terms of what we accomplished this year, uh, I will say that there are a lot and um, what this presentation, you know, this presentation doesn't uh, capture everything, but it captures a lot of what, a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, big initiatives that we did accomplish. And so I'll start with just our DEIB objectives. Uh, these objectives were actually um, outlined um, by the uh, DEIB planning committee that I worked with last uh, last spring. And so they came up with these specific initiatives for this 2022-2023 school year. And the goal here is that each year we will come up with new um, uh, initiatives to focus on. And again, all of these initiatives align to each of the priority areas that are here. And so, you know, the check marks that you see basically indicates that we have accomplished uh, what we set out to do this year. And in addition, the rotating arrow that you see there means that the work continues, right? This work of DEIB never ends. And so um, while the specific initiatives that are noted here are completed, the work within each of these priority areas are never finished. And so, you know, I will touch on a few of those initiatives in terms of uh, PD. You know, we did uh, spend a lot of time on this this year where we actually incorporated DEIB uh, professional development opportunities for all of our faculty. And so I had the pleasure of, of presenting to all of our faculty, with the exception of the middle school, which we really just ran out of time, but we are slated to begin with the middle school in the fall. 
Um, I presented on topics such as uh, macroaggressions, um, you know, really uh, helping our faculty understand why we are making the shift from inclusion to belonging, right? And not to say that inclusion, you know, the work around inclusion isn't important, but it's a, it's 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 the shift that we're making uh, towards belonging that really encompasses everyone feeling like they are connected in our community. Um, in terms of, um, let's see, cultural responsive curriculum, you know, equitable and inclusive classroom, you have heard a lot about our MTSS, multi-tier system of support, uh, from our assistant superintendent of teaching and learning, uh, Kristen Anderson. And so if you want to learn more about our MTSS framework, uh, please, please get in touch with Kristen. Um, in terms of our family and student engagement, uh, you know, we this year, you know, very exciting. We brought back our um, multicultural uh, food festival, which was widely attended. And I know many folks in our community who are really looking forward uh, uh, to that event. And of course, it will be back next year. In terms of hiring, uh, Denise Zahn, who's the human uh, director of human resources, we spent a lot of time this year on our hiring, mentoring, and retention strategies. Um, and I will share a little bit more about that on the next slide, so I won't get too much into it. And then, of course, in terms of uh, accountability, uh, we had a uh, we met monthly with the DEIB uh, steering committee. And um, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in, in, in the presentation. So let's go over some specific uh, accomplishments uh, from this year. And again, I'm not gonna touch on everything on this, on, on this slide because there are a lot. And, and I will also say that um, what is noted on this slide does not capture everything <laughs> that we actually accomplished. I have a full, uh, uh, a spreadsheet of that. Um, but again, I just selected a couple of things from each of the DEIB priority areas. So in terms of PD, as I mentioned, you know, 84% of uh, PD participation from faculty. Um, again, those PD offerings, uh, um, uh, 15 of those PD offerings, uh, or rather 10 of those PD offerings were focused on DEIB. We had 27 educators um, who were enrolled in our Ideas Anti-Racist School Practices course, uh, which again, Dr. Paula Martin, uh, our district cultural competency consultant, uh, facilitates. Um, we participated in a virtual one-year professional learning community cohort that is hosted by DESI. Um, and this cohort really is to help districts, it's really support districts um, who are enhancing teacher diversification and recruitment recruitment strategies. In terms of school culture, uh, first, uh, first of its kind, first time this year, approximately 300 ninth grade students participated in the ideas uh, training, uh, which was which was a bias training. Um, and again, in the past, we have partnered with the ADL anti defamation league. Uh, but we really felt that going into this year was important that all of our ninth graders were able to receive that bias training. Um, and again, on some ongoing work at the middle school, of course, is our Celtics Playbook Initiative. Um, this year, close to 90 students were selected and trained to be playbook leaders, and they facilitated uh, the playbook uh, initiative, uh, um, the bias training over the course um, uh, actually back in the fall they they conducted this training so the training is actually roughly three three and a half to about four hours and so um that training occurred in the morning in both uh at conquer middle school with all the sixth graders seventh and eighth, uh, and eighth graders uh let's see a couple of things here uh, in terms of Culturally responsive curriculum, uh, 13 diverse books were reviewed for adoption at the primary and secondary levels by the Cultural Competence, Competency and Literature Committee, which is facilitated by our Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, Kristen Anderson. Uh, we have 14 educators, K through 12 on the committee, which includes our librarians. Uh, we created, um, going into the next year, actually, we have since created uh, uh, bringing back 
history, uh, Black history to CCHS, which is a course uh, that a group of 11th and 12th graders uh, will focus on with, with their social studies teacher, with a social studies teacher to develop a project-based Black history course. And so this course is slated to begin um, uh, in uh, the official course will begin in the 2024-2025 school year. Uh, a couple of important things here uh, to note, I think student engagement, again, student and community engagement, uh, you know, again, the multicultural food festival, the at the elementary level, all the heritage and international festivals that occurred. Um, so there were several student conferences offered this year. We had five uh, CCHS students who attended the Ideas High School Leadership Conference that occurred in, in December. Um, we had uh, Concord Middle School students of color participated in the annual Tenacity Challenge, which is hosted by Bedford Public Schools. Uh, this is an academic competition in math, science, and leadership. Uh, we had eight CCHS Boston students attend the MDA, Medical Directors Association, Youth uh, Forum Conference. And this year's um, topic was titled, Love in the Skin I'm In, an intentional uh, session to discuss reclaiming identities as Medco students. In terms of hiring, mentoring, and retention, uh, we appointed eight DEIB teacher leads across five of our five out of six of our schools to lead DEIB initiatives within their school building. Uh, this effort was supported uh, by the CCTA and CTA. Uh, let's see. Again, we acquired membership with uh, the Massachusetts Partnership for Diversity in Education, MPDE. This is a 50-member district organization working collaboratively each month to enhance uh, and expand teacher diversification strategies and applicant pools. And because we are members of MPDE, we actually have access to their applicant pool, which has a ton, a ton, a ton of um, uh, educators of color who are looking for, you know, opportunities across districts in the Commonwealth. Um, I'm excited to share, and I, I think we shared this back in the fall, that we were awarded uh, roughly $15,846 per district. Uh, so each district received this amount uh, from DESE, again, to support the efforts uh, that we are engaged in around teacher diversification here in our, in our school district. Um, and then lastly, I touch on a couple of uh, accountability pieces here. We, of course, have two METCO parent representatives, Aisha Lawton and Domingos De Rosa, who were appointed on the school committee. Uh, early in the fall, we instituted a derogatory uh, language policy that was supported, again, uh, by the school committee. Um, we have ensured that there's METCO transportation for Boston students on the weekends and during school vacation weeks. The admin team uh, back in August received training on um, how we investigate Title uh, VI and Title IX uh, civil rights violations. Uh, this training was offered by Paige Tobin, who is our district uh, uh, legal counsel. And then, of course, uh, currently we are uh, sort of in the implementation stage of rolling out our bias incident response protocol and report and form. And as of this week, Concord Middle School is actually piloting that report and form. Um, and we have already um, sort of uh, received a few reports uh, from students who now feel empowered uh, to be upstanders. So I'll touch on a couple of other pertinent DEIB information, starting with our DEIB and anti-racism anti steering committee. I wanna just say thank you, thank you, thank you to every member on this committee, as you will see there. Uh, it was very well represented um, from you know our MECO directors all the way to uh, members from CPAC, our Human Rights Council, CORE, um, school committee. We had student representatives, which was especially important to include their voices in this work. And then over to the right, a far right is all the um, are all the topics that 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 were uh, presented you know, within this committee. Uh, professional development uh, presentation was provided by Kristen Anderson. Uh, she also presented on our um, academic achievement data. Um, I presented on our bias incident reporting system. 
Uh, we had our MECO directors, uh, Felicia Paisley and Deborah Jemerson, present uh, on MECO and where we are with, with our program. Um, we had uh, Denise Zahn, who is going to present on hiring and retention, um, actually this month. And of course, we also had uh, Debbie Dixon and Val Granswicks, who presented on special education. And then for June, uh, my plan, my goal actually is to give this exact presentation to the committee uh, to, close this, to close us out uh, for the year. In terms of uh, our student, DEIB Student Advisory Council, this is very new this year. This was one of my major goals this year was to really start uh, to meet with students and hear about some of their ideas, some of their initiatives uh, uh, within this work. And so we have um, right at the top are the students who are part of this advisory council. We have Jason, Autumn, Maddie, Cosmos, Amelia, Alex, Ramir, and Aya. Um, all of these students are currently uh, Concord, uh, Concord Carlisle High School students, and we met. Uh, we had our we held our first meeting uh, back in uh, February, and these are some of the initiatives that that we brainstormed that they felt was important uh, to elevate going into next year. So again, I'll touch on a few here. Number one was to ensure diversity in school meals which I know that our director of food services, uh, um, Jess Brown, is very much uh, focused on uh, this year. Um, we, we also talked about, uh, rather the students talked a lot about creating more affinity spaces and activities for students. Um, we spent some time talking about how we can better promote um, collaboration across all student clubs and organizations. I think um, students really want to be more um, inclusive um, of some of the activities that they host. For example, if Black Student Union is hosting an event, well, they should think they should think about inviting other students like Spectrum, you know, student government, um, our newly uh, cemented um, Asian affinity group, right? Just to ensure that students feel like they are part of not just their own clubs that they participate in, but part of the CCHS uh, community as a whole. And so the work of the student advisory group will continue in the fall. Um, and again, just very excited to, to be meeting with students. In terms of our district uh, uh, demographics, our racial uh, diversity of staff and students, uh, this is a resource um, directly from the Human Resources Department. Um, again, Denise Zahn, Director of um, HR, we, we have spent a lot of time really looking at, you know, our, our, our hiring and retention strategies, our recruitment strategies. And earlier this year, um, the data that you see on the left was data that we collected uh, to share with our with our membership with the MPDE, Massachusetts Partnership for Diversity and Education. And so when you look at our district, um, again, both districts, CPS, CCRSD, uh, we found that about 26% of our students are students of color. And then when we looked at our faculty and support staff, um, roughly 11.47% uh, are faculty and support staff of color. In terms of our hiring and, I'm not sure what that was, in terms of our hiring and retention data uh, for CPS, as you will see there, uh, since 2019, um, you know, we, we went back that far to just, you know, take a, 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 a further look into what our, um, how we've been diversifying our, our faculty and staff. And so back in 2019, uh, roughly 25% of all new hires uh, were uh, faculty and support staff of color. And as you will see, I think we're right back to where we were uh, back in 2019. And so this year, uh, again, 25% of, of all new hires were faculty and support staff of color. And the graph below so, uh, shows um, our, our, our trends over the last uh, couple of years. Within this time frame, again, within so since 2019 uh, to present uh, day, um, we have hired on the CPS side, we've hired 41 uh, BIPOC uh, employees, again, as faculty and support staff. 11 of those BIPOC employees are no longer in the district. And so we have been able to retain roughly 30 of those BIPOC employees between 2019 uh, to date. 
if you look on the CCRSD side, um, since uh, 2019, back in 2019, roughly 13% of all new hires uh, were uh, faculty and support staff of color. Um, this year, all new hires accounted for about 16% uh, faculty and support staff of color. So within this time frame, again, from 2019 all the way to, to now, uh, 15 BIPOC employees have been hired. Uh, five of those BIPOC employees are no longer in the district, and we've been able to retain uh, 10 of those BIPOC employees since 2019. So total, if you're you know doing the math, uh, both districts combined, that's roughly 56 BIPOC employees hired since 2019, and 16 of those BIPOC employees are no longer in our district. All right, in terms of bias incidents, uh, so this year we really uh, began to be intentional about tracking some of the bias incidents that are occurring within our schools. And so, you know, I'll start with this pie chart that is here. Uh, as you will know, uh, roughly, you know, we we experienced roughly 10, 10 incidents of, of where students used uh, racial slurs or made racist comments uh, to homophobic uh, 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 incidents. Uh, one um, incident dealing with uh, Islamophobic slurs and two incidents related to anti-Semitism. Some information uh, that I think is worth noting here from our equity audit findings, 92% um, of, uh, of parents uh, felt comfortable reporting racial harassment or discrimination they witnessed at their child's school to a teacher or their principal. 81% uh, of teachers felt comfortable reporting racial harassment or, or discrimination that they experienced. 87% uh, of teachers uh, feel comfortable reporting racial harassment or discrimination they witness. 60% of middle school and high school students of color and 64% of white students at the middle and high schools were unaware of a process for handling incidents of racial, ethnic discrimination or bias incidences. Both students of color and white students reported experiencing discrimination or bias and not reporting it. So in terms of some of the training programs that we have instituted to, um, to help prevent um, bias incidents or hate crimes in our schools, um, of course, our ideas, one, uh, anti-racist practices in schools for our educators is an ongoing um, professional development offering each year. We have our Celtics Playbook Initiative at the middle school, um, which is, again, is an implicit bias, anti-bullying, anti-discrimination training program. And we are expanding the Celtics Playbook Initiative to the fifth graders um, starting in the fall. Our ninth grade academy, uh, Ideas Implicit Bias Training Program. Again, this was the first time this year that we pulled all 300 ninth graders together for this bias training, and that will continue again in the fall. And then, of course, you know, a lot of the work that is happening at the elementary level with the adoption of responsive classroom and Fly Five. Um, I will ask that folks reach out directly to Chris and Anderson uh, to hear a little bit more about Fly Five and, of course, our implementation of responsive classroom in the fall. And we are going to see that on Tuesday night. Perfect. Perfect, Perfect timing. <laughs> You'll hear some of yeah. Some it's of part it. of a big part, part of a yeah. big picture discussion, right? So again, uh, expanding on our bias, uh, our bias incidents, um, we are um, really you know in the, in the process of implementing our bias incident response protocol and reporting form. This visual here um, has been you know a two year process yeah. of really making sure that we are consistent across all of our schools in terms of how we respond to bias uh, incidents and hate crimes that uh, that uh, might occur in our schools. And so again, this visual really uh, outlines what our protocol, what our response protocol is. And then in terms of our reporting form, you know, this is hard to see, but a link to the live bias report and form that is now available at Concord Middle School um, is now available for students at Concord Middle School. So if you click on this link, it will take you right to that form so that you are able to see a copy of it. Um, and again, you know, we've already heard from students, you know, we rolled out this form on Monday and 
we have already received uh, reports from students. So again, you know, they feel empowered. They feel that they can be upstanders who who disrupt, who intervene um, um, when these incidents are happening. And again, the whole point of this rollout is to make sure that students do follow through and report these incidents when they happen. So now looking ahead, um, I think, again, there's a lot of information that I've captured here, but um, looking ahead to next year, um, our work continues. And so there are specific initiatives that we will focus on next year. And again, each initiative really aligns, again, back to the uh, priority, uh, priority areas of the DEIB strategic plan. And so for PD, you know, we, we are going to offer our PD uh, paths, again, that are gonna be available to, to our educators. Um, we are actively reviewing uh, our district budget uh, so that we are able to allocate um, some fiscal resources to ensure that our professional development offerings is available and accessible uh, to our support staff, uh, pre-K through 12. Um, in terms of school culture, uh, of course, many of you have heard, you know, we are in the process of implementing our restorative practices across all the schools, especially at the secondary level. Um, we are also, uh, in terms of culturally responsive curriculum, um, you know, you know, the uh, Black History course that I mentioned earlier um, is, is really historical, right? Because I think, um, Joe Zellner, who was a former history teacher, you know, when he retired many, many years ago, I say maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, the course really ended with him. So there used to be a black history course that that Mrs. Zellner actually taught. And so when he retired, that course um, sort of, you know, retired with him. And so I'm again, very excited that we are taking an intentional approach and in bringing this course, uh, this course back. And then of course, our work around reviewing diverse books will continue um, next year with our cultural competency and literature committee. Um, so uh, more to come on that. In terms of student and family engagement, um, you know, new this year, we, we uh, you know, I collaborated with, with various community partners to host our MLK Junior Day breakfast. Um, again, I think that 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 event will continue next year. Um, we are going to still continue to support our ninth grade academy, Nubian Square Tour, uh, which is uh, supported by MECO headquarters and of course, MECO CEO, Millie Abahe Thomas. Uh, we are going to support the student government in expanding the multicultural uh, food festival. And then of course, the international festivals at the elementary, across the elementary schools. Um, our ninth graders, again, uh, will participate in the ideas by training in the fall, the expansion of the Celtics Playbook Initiative to our fifth graders will also occur in the fall. Um, and then I'm, again, hoping to continue uh, my, my, my uh, meetings and, 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 and uh, my meetings with students uh, in the DEIB Student Advisory Council. In terms of hiring and um, hiring, mentoring, and retention, we are, you know, we are going to continue leveraging uh, MPDE, um, you know, as we uh, look to hire more diverse educators across teaching, administration, and and staff positions. Um, our goal next year, Denise and I, you know, we were able to attend the MPDE hiring fair uh, this year. And so our goal next year is to attend at least two hiring fairs next year. And there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes to prepare for, for, the, for those diversity fairs. And so um, that's, that's our goal next year. Um, we are working with the CCTA um, to host a focus group with Wellesley College. Uh, to learn um, to learn a little bit about how we can enhance our district's um, uh, strategies when it comes to recruitment, um, hiring, and retention. And so we are working closely with Wellesley College to um, really invite uh, any of their uh, students of color and then uh, faculty of color to, to join us in that focus group. So more to come on that. Uh, in terms of institution accountability, of course, our bias incident response protocol and reporting system, um, you know, my goal is to have this fully implemented um, by the end of the year, so in by the end of December. Um, but again, there's a lot of work that is going into making sure that 
you know, folks in our community are aware of, of, of this system that we are rolling out. And then in addition to that, there are specific uh, training workshops that we are going to offer for our faculty and staff, for students, and for our parent community. So more to come on that. And then very exciting, I think, you know, again, you, you can learn more from, from Chris and Anderson. We, we have um, partnered with Link it am I saying it right? It's not LinkedIn, it's LinkedIn. I think so. Uh -huh. <laughs> to create our data dashboard, which you know, I think many of us are really excited uh to see. And this this data dashboard will highlight a lot of the district metrics and baseline data that we are all uh looking uh looking for and 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 all the data will be available um in our in our dashboard in real time. So it'll be real time progress monitoring. Uh, so a lot of great things are happening there. I will end with uh, three uh, end of the year events that I know many folks in our community are participating in. Uh, Living the Legacy of METCO is an annual conference that is hosted by uh, METCO headquarters. Uh, this event is happening on Friday, June 2nd. Uh, we have roughly 21 educators uh from our district that will be attending this conference uh the waiting hour is a presentation by ron jones uh, ron is the executive director and artistic principal with dialogues on diversity uh ron has has actually been in concord many times he's presented on meco um he's presented on uh mlk and shared dreams um he he understands you know what is needed here in the community and so i'm working closely with him um uh, on this event which will be on monday june 5th and this particular event is on zoom and then lastly race amity day uh community potluck uh, this is our second annual event uh, which is organized um, by myself, um, Rich Yamatino, who is co-chair of the uh, Concord Carlisle Human Rights um, Council, and uh, G. Orloff, who is a site director at the Montessori School here in Concord. So um, together, we are the planning committee <laughs> for the Race Emily Day uh, potluck, and I believe we are actually partnering with uh, Joe Palumbo, who is now chair of the Concord uh, Town of Concord DEI Commission, to host this event. So this event is really open to you know all students, families, employees uh, who who work and live in this in this community. So I hope you will join us on Sunday, June 11th, and this event will be at Alcott. And that is all that I have for today. Just want to say again, thank you to, you know, there are many folks in this in this picture, but again, as you will see, um, the work around DEIB in our community really is, is a community effort. It is not just me as the DEIB director leading this. I think I have a, a coalition. I have a team um, of folks really behind me supporting this work uh, from Dr. Hunter to the school committee, to our admin team, to our ccta and cta to our students um just everyone really uh, uh is, is is in support and committed uh to this work so thank you and looking forward to what we can accomplish next year wow that was it's so much information is on here can i ask you can we get a link to your presentation yes, yes for course. members that aren't here um so then and we'll probably link it to the agenda too just so people can absolutely see it. there's literally so much information yeah. that it's amazing yeah. so thank you for all of that so i'm going to open it up to the committee uh, first for questions comments and i know sarah's online so sarah if you have any questions just use the raise hand feature so i can see you but I'll I'll leave it to everyone first, and I have some questions. Do you want to go around? I didn't want to start. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Go right ahead. Um, yeah. So thanks, Andrew. Um, that was a lot. Like as Tracy said, I'm excited to go back and read it again. <laughs> take some take my time with it. A couple of just um, I mean, clearly there's been a lot of work on this space, and I think that's amazing. I guess my like over, my biggest overall question, um, and is more. I have some specific questions, but then my biggest overall question is kind of anecdotally, 
Can you speak to like how you think, how you think students think, not that I want you to speak for other people, but how do you think we're doing in this work? And like, these are all very tangible, awesome things, but like, what's the impact if that? Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, when I think about our students, um, particularly around some of the diverse books that we're implementing, I know when I talk to students, they are feeling like it's about time, right? It's Mm -hmm. about time they felt represented represented right mm-hmm. not just in the curriculum but someone in the district is actually paying attention to them to their identities to their stories right and so um you know i, I want one of the um quotes that i actually wanted to read on one of the slides uh, one of the students in the deib um advisory council um actually talked a lot about the need for teachers to feel comfortable giving students more diverse books so they want more choices right not Uh, just as a choice not just as a choice but as everyone as all school read a summer read you know um so i know they certainly students in particular um are really feeling the impact of this work that it is intentional right that we are paying attention right um and then of course for the faculty you know i think i have looked through the equity audit uh, data. And what is surprising, well, I wouldn't say it's surprising to me when I think about what is happening in other districts. But here in Concord, I feel like there's just such a strong commitment for the work, right? I mean, to have both teacher associations behind this work, and to, um, you know, talk about the values in this work amongst each other and the need for more professional development. I mean, we already offer so much and they're asking for more, Mm -hmm. right? They're hungry, right? Uh, For for more PD. Um, And I think the most important piece, particularly for faculty, is for faculty of color to feel like they, that they are comfortable enough to, 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 to be in a space where they feel comfortable enough to speak up. Right about some of the inequities that that impact them as educators, but are impacting students that are right in front of them. I think we have heard from you know m- many of our faculty of color this year about the experiences. Um, f- you know they feel empowered to share those experiences with us. Um, so I think so I think we're making progress there. Um, and of course, you know when you look at our retention rates. Um, you know, we would love to retain everyone, of course, but, you know, we know there are other factors at play uh, in terms of, of retaining our educators. But I know we are very much intentional about um, um, how we we retain those educators. Um, and then I think, you know, community wide, um, beyond the walls of our schools, you know, we have community partners that are, you know, in support of the work that we do um, trust the work is happening in our schools and that we are putting the needs, uh, the diverse needs of our students and of course our educators um, at the center of everything. And so looking through, um, you know, making decisions through the lens of DEIB, um, making sure that folks feel represented, making sure that our, our, our historically marginalized groups are at the seat are at the table, right? Um, you know, I mentioned the appointment of, of Aisha Lawton and, and Domingos as, as MECO representatives on the school committee. Like those those steps that we are taking actually makes our community, you know, more inclusive mm-hmm. because folks look at that appointment and, say, and see that, hey, we have someone that looks like me mm-hmm. who's serving on the school committee and perhaps can carry the voices and my experiences when they are uh, when they are in the space, when they are in these uh, school committee meetings. And so that's important. Um, so I think overall, you know, I, I continue to say that we have really built a coalition <laughs> uh, around this work and and the support and the commitment is is is, you know, I'm I'm just grateful <laughs> to be in in Concord, in Concord uh, Public Schools, Concord Carlisle Regional School District, where um, there's no doubt right there's no doubt in terms of the support and the commitment in this work um and we are just we're just grinding we're just yeah we're just it feels really grinding, like so you have worked really hard um just from this presentation and hearing you speak previously and yeah. my own observations like there there have been like real intentional foundational things put into place um at the all the different levels mm-hmm. 
Um, and I'm just really excited to see how over time, I mean, it's not going to happen immediately ho over time, how those blocks kind of hopefully build um, an even stronger community. Absolutely. Um, and not to, I, 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 we have a lot of work to do. Um, and, um, but this feels like a really good start. Yeah. Um, you did touch on one of my other questions mm -hmm. on the teacher retention. Mm -hmm. Do you know how that speak, how that compares to like our white teacher population? It, yeah, that, that would, that's interesting. Uh, it seemed high to me because yeah. I feel like our teachers, um, and so I'm just curious what, what you're doing on the retention yeah, piece. I will definitely look up that data in okay. comparison. Um, but in terms of the retention piece, um, you know, new this year, as I mentioned, we received a grant award from yes. Desi. And so one of the areas that we're looking at is, you know, tuition reimbursement. You know, we know yeah. a lot of our tutors, um, particularly many of our tutors of color, are interested in pursuing uh, their educator license, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that I think, one of the, not I think, it's a fact, one of the ways you retain <laughs> faculty support staff of color is by supporting them through that process, right? And I think we have heard from a lot of our educators of color currently who have, who are requesting um specific financial incentives to mm -hmm. support them in that process and does that grant give you some flexibility on how you use it like is it you could do like a signing yes bonus signing or bonus. or you could kind of figure out what the needs absolutely. are absolutely so the uh the so the grant actually is supporting the following incentives signing bonuses is one tuition reimbursement relocation assistance okay um just to name a few um and so again we are here in from our educators of color in the district, both sides, uh, CPS and CCRSD, um, who have since requested some financial need. Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, it's- it's Yeah, it looks like it's gonna mostly go to people who are already here, right. uh, primarily because our salaries are strong enough, we draw right. people without mm -hmm. the bonuses. Um, but I think one really important thing that happened in putting mm -hmm. the information out to the diverse staff was we learned what their goals are. We learned what they're working on. We learned a lot about what else we can do to support them besides these, you know, relatively minor amounts of money. Cause how many people responded? 20? Over 20. Over 20. Yeah. We only have 30,000 across two districts. Yeah. So it's not huge fiscal uh, incentive, but we now know what they're working on. And I feel like that was really yeah. powerful. If we can continue to support them to meet their yeah professional yeah. goals, right? So that once they are licensed, they stay here in Concord. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. That's the goal. So um... I have one other one. <laughs> um, this is quick, I think. I'm just curious what the plan is for the bias reporting mm. form for the like broader rollout. Like, you Absolutely. mentioned end of year, but is that just six to 12? How, like, how do you, how are you thinking? Yeah, so, so I think the focus right now is, you know, middle and high school. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, you know, as we sort of come to a close this year, what I'm working on is actually um, a document that's basically like an FAQ, mm -hmm. um, because I think it's important before going into next year, that families really understand the why of, you know, that this buys uh, uh, reporting form. And so I have a document that I've been working on for for, for a couple of weeks now that um, it's in a draft form. Uh, Dr. Hunter needs to review it, um, but it will share a lot more information about sort of our implementation plan, our timeline for, for the training uh, 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 workshops that we will offer in the fall. Um, but I think the focus currently is is middle high school students. Thank you. Sorry. Sure. Okay. To you guys. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> for my questions as well. First, thank you uh, for all of the work you've done. Um, when you think about the depth of the work in just one year, yeah. it's incredible and it's multidimensional. Mm -hmm. And also, thank you to Dr. Hunter for supporting and allowing this um, work to be so done great. in the district. It's meaningful and it's necessary. Yeah. Um, just, just all the information all of the work from all the different angles that you are working at and involving student voice, which is so important. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nice to know that you have someone looking out for you, but mm -hmm. also have a voice in that work that's representing you. Right. Um, 
I just had one question. When you were talking about professional development, mm -hmm. I think there was a stat of 84% were per, mm -hmm. at, the, at the participants were faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm, I'm curious to know why that number isn't 100%. Or, yeah, yeah, no. Did that. you include the faculty meetings in that number? No, I did not. So that, 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 that's where it's 100%. Just, that's where it's 100%. So I uh, that was just focused on the PD okay. paths. Yeah, it's just curious. And again, you know, we, we offered 15 PD paths, but just 10 of them were focused on DEIB. Okay. So you're not, you know, even when that number. So the faculty meeting was a change for us because we wanted to be sure we had opportunities that all staff participated in. Um, so we didn't quite get there at the middle school because of the way the calendar worked. But all the other schools had 100 percent of the teaching faculty present for three sessions this this year. So that to us was game changing in a way because it took it away from being optional or voluntary to mandated. So and those PD paths are a choice, right? So you have 84% choosing yes. okay. this, yes. those paths yes. too, which I think is, you know, just speaks to the fact that you said how much support right. that you really feel from the faculty. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we did include the DEIB, I'm sure we're probably yeah. upwards of 98%. That's amazing. Well, thank yeah. you. It's, it's a lot of work to, you know, um, Kind of cultivate mm. cultural responsiveness and responsibility, and you've done that. So yeah. thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Or sorry, I've got a few questions, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I, I got here in 1985. The conversations were uh, sadly similar. Mm. You know, we, we've been at this a long time, um, but a great deal has changed in the last couple of years. Um, so thank you, because I think you've uh, been uh, positioned uh, appropriately to 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 lead it for us. Um, I've got a few questions. They're going to go in in a few different areas. Um, the I, I want to start with the reporting form um, because I see that as a uh, valuable tool, mm -hmm. but I'm not yet convinced it's an empowering tool. And and here's why. Um, we, for many years here, have really espoused the idea of putting uh, trusted adults at the disposal of our kids, of our students, that that was really central to uh, kids being safe. Um, and, and so I'm curious, is can we simply say that the web-based reporting tool is the empowering tool that the trusted adults are not. How do those two fit together? Can you speak to that? Yeah. Because, because my instinct says I'd go to the trusting adult before I would formally expose myself mm -hmm. in a web-based portal mm -hmm. if I was a child. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how that, how you think that works and mm -hmm. what you've heard from Belmont yeah. and yeah. <laughs> and other other and I know it's a work in progress it, too. So, so we're doing progress. a little bit of speculation here. Right. I get that. Right. I get so that. just two points. Number one, I strongly believe every child deserves a trusted adult. Correct. Okay, that's number one. And I think if we were to survey students, I think the majority of students will say to you that they do have a trusted adult that they can absolutely go to. And then number two, the bias reporting form can be completed anonymously, right? And I know, you know, earlier in the winter through our DEIB steering committee, we had one student, a couple of students actually said to us, you know, some of us that are on the committee said, you know, if we, if we, I don't want to use the word force, but if we create this form and it enables students to identify themselves when they are when they complete the form, it actually will deter them from even making that report in the first place, right? And so we we listened, we we acknowledged that feedback from our students, and in addition to that committee meeting, I also held a focus group specifically with our um, our middle school Celtics playbook leaders. And we had one um, um, high school student who joined that meeting. And they, ec they echoed those same sentiments, right? 
we have to make that form anonymous. If I'm a student that just witnessed a bias incident, students know they have the option to go to their trusted adult. Yeah. They absolutely know that. What was clear in the equity audit, right, is that students also were unaware of a mechanism in which they could capture that incident in a form, in some document, and, you know, and so creating this form allows them to sometimes in real time, right, they are able to go to, con you know, cms.conquerps.org and fill out that form immediately after that incident happens and not wait two, three months, right, to report that incident. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I won't sit here to say that, you know, some of, even some of the recent, just as, just since Monday, we have had students who, because of the assembly we held on Monday, did walk away from that assembly feeling like, wow, there is a, there is a form that I can now fill out and I'm going to follow up on an incident that happened three months ago. And this right. is a, an assembly just to roll out the form. Just to roll out the, roll form, out the form for now. middle, for, middle for Concord Middle School, right? And so... We do have trusted adults. Students know who their trusted adults are. I think this bias reporting form adds another layer of, I don't know, communication, of choice, of access, right? To be able to now say, okay, if 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 this incident happened during school, right, and I'm not and I'm not feeling comfortable to go to that trusted adult, well, guess what? When I get home, I can fill out this form. Right. And this form goes directly to the principal. It goes to me. Right. And investigation is 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 um is 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 started. Um, um and so again, I think I think, you know, uh, it does it does empower students. And we have seen that even <laughs> within the, you know, within three days of of rolling this out at the at the middle school. Um, so I think part of this this rollout of the middle school, and I said to Principal Cameron, is we definitely want to also survey students. Um, I'm hoping, you know, there's a lot going on <laughs> between now and the end of the school year, but early in the fall, we definitely want to survey students uh, to see how they are um, sort of accessing this form, whether it is impactful for them, right? I think it's important that we capture that. Yeah, I think I'd just add to that. We saw very loud and clear in the equity audit, the kids don't know how to report other than the trusted adult. So I think it was really purposeful that we lay that out for them and intentionally tell them. Um, other pieces that we've seen very clearly, their work, they're looking for a way to do that. We've had more dummied emails come to us lately where they create a fake account so they can report um, social media is another spot that is where reporting is happening, which is exactly where we don't want the report because we don't have access to it. It requires another child sometimes to tell us and to give them a really, really de definitive place to go aside from the trusted adult um, seemed seemed really critical. And I'll, I'll echo the this feedback from the kids was it needs to be anonymous. Um, so we're we're going to work through that and look to see how that plays itself out. Um, but it's it was a really I think some of it's how you deliver the message to that assembly. I was there. Um, the question was posed to the entire seventh and eighth grade: How many of you have witnessed mm -hmm. an act of hate, prejudice, bias? The entire auditorium, every hand went up. We aren't getting 400 reports, so we needed to to offer them another another tool. The message from the kids, some of the kids presented to their peers, Andrew, Justin, was very clearly of empowerment, um, and that this was an opportunity to make it a more welcoming, belonging, inclusive environment. So um, we're really hopeful. It's been a been a great. We were, I'll be honest, we were skeptical. Very. We were very skeptical. Yeah. <laughs> this administrative team really pushed back at the beginning. Like, we're just going to get flooded with anonymous fake reports, and all we're going to do is chase that. And um, we really did the homework and time and mm -hmm. listening activities with the kids to realize that probably wasn't the case. We need. It was just really important that we give them the opportunity. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I just want When we talk about trusted adult, we have, like, the portrait of the... Concord graduate. 
Have we surveyed the kids to find out what the portrait of a trusted adult looks like mm-hmm. and what those traits are? Yeah, and maybe cool. share that with the staff. So right. if that's what the kids are looking for mm-hmm. uh, and that's what they're drawn to, that that might be yeah, a cool. great point. That. Yeah. yeah, that's great. You referenced uh, the new data platform or the dashboard, mm-hmm. linked it, I guess, was it? I think, yeah, that's, I think that's it. We think that's it. I it's look it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. that in our... 2024 budget? Yes, Kristen's budgeted for it. Okay. All right. Um, because we do understand fr- from the administration that uh, our DEIB work is so embedded everywhere mm-hmm. that we can't really ascertain what our budget is, what our resources are devoted to it um, in, in its entirety. Um, but I think uh, it's important to the school committee that uh, you're confident you've got the resources to to do what you want uh, on our behalf. Um, I'll share with you what I suppose is a a, a leading and rhetorical comment here. Um, I'm I'm of a mind that uh, genuine uh, lasting culture change is gonna take years of sustained work before it's embedded as the language uh, has it. do you, here's my leading question. Do you foresee a time when perhaps in five or seven years, I don't know what it would be, that uh, we can uh, have things sufficiently embedded so that we're not stipending as much of this work as we are now, but it becomes everybody's business, not stipended work for individuals? Because it strikes me much of the uh, effort that you have suggested to us does require uh financial compensation to individuals and specific uh people and groups around the district Mm -hmm. i i hope for the day when it's everybody's business Mm -hmm. and it's absent specific compensation related to deib Mm -hmm. is that too lofty a dream yeah, I'm. I'm okay. I mean, I, I I was just gonna. I know what I think. You I'll go ahead. Share first. the example Dr. Hanser uh, shared with me a couple of days ago about our our um, about our retention. You know, when you walked in here, 2017, I think the number of uh, the 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 percentage of students of color, right, yeah. was around what 10 percent. Uh, it's 50, it was 15, and it's 15. 25 now. And it's right, and it's now 26 yeah. percent, right, and so. Um, that's that's one data point. When we look at our, um, in terms of our commitment in diversifying our staff, right? We have both uh, unions committed to that, to that uh, uh, work, to those efforts, right? And so it's not just my work, right? It is the work of other folks in the community who are seeing the value in the work on DEIB and they are saying, you know what, we need to do more in these specific areas, whether it's hiring, whether it's professional development, whether it's school culture. And then in terms of school culture, you know, we just spend some time talking with um, uh, Joe Palumbo about the culture that we have created at Concord Middle School, right? I think a few years ago, if, you know, if, if, if you were to talk with students at at Sanborn or Peabody, you would have felt that they were just two separate middle schools, right? It was Peabody Middle School and Sanborn Middle School, right? And now we have, you know, a lot of effort (laughs) from Principal Cameron, right? To shift that mindset to to a culture where all students at Concord Middle School feel like they are one, right? That it is one Concord Middle School and not this two to uh, two worlds that they're living in, um, in, in, in um, within that um, time frame of their uh, educational journey. Um, so I think you know there are, and I can go you know I can go on with many examples, um, but I do think you know e- even with our PD paths, right? The data is there. Our faculty want more professional development, right? Focused on DEIB. And here's where it gets even, I, I just, it just dawned on me, in the equity audit, the majority of our faculty actually are, um, actually welcome the idea of us evaluating them on their level of cultural uh, proficiency, right? They actually are inviting that and they are 
um, they are open to that. And, 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 you know, I'll add that Desi already has a rubric. <laughs> I mean, our teacher rubric, includes you know, it. includes it already. And so if our teachers were saying, you know, we're doing all this work, how can we get some, you know, how can we get evaluated on it? So we know we are on the right track. Well, guess what? We, sh we should begin to look into that and start um, having that be part of our supervision evaluation uh, um, uh, process and, 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 you know, dialogue with our educators. Um, so in terms of accountability, right? Like they're holding themselves accountable to, to, to how this work is evolving for them and their practice. Um, yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is just, uh, all those goals you described are exactly where we want to be. And yet the teacher leader role is such a value for us and so powerful for us as a school district on all topics um, that I I don't know when the point will be where we would want to, to not specifically name teacher leaders among the faculty. Um, having been at different meetings, faculty meetings where those leaders are running the discussion and the session and really some embedded PD, um, the response of the colleague to colleague interaction is just so meaningful. And they talk to each other as teachers, not that we're not educators, but people who are in classrooms day to day talk differently to each other than they do to us for lots of really valid reasons. Um, and I just not sure we'd want to lean, lean off of that. Um, so do you have your teacher leads in place? I know at one point you were still looking for one maybe at the row, like, do you, do you feel like you have them at each school identified and will they continue next year? Absolutely. So I think uh, um, I am, you know, I meet with all of our DEIB teacher leads every other week. Um, and so oh, I don't, I don't know about the DEIB teacher. Oh, yeah. So, so each, each building essentially, you know, I work very closely with the uh, CTA and CCTA presidents last year to you know, essentially create a position where we have one or two um, uh, uh, educators in each of our school building who really competent, who can really, um, you know, now you know, number one, work closely with their colleagues around this work, um, you know, providing uh, PD opportunities, um, and then number two, someone to really be the spoke beyond me, right? Because of course I can't get to all six schools every single day, right? But but have another individual, another educator that can partner with me in helping um, in helping them meet the needs within their school building around the DEIB work. Um, so that the the position has really evolved nicely where the DEIB teacher leads are facilitating their building Bates cultural competency committee, which serves as sort of a steering committee right for their school building and so um the admin team within that school building works closely with the teacher the eib teacher lead um to you know to draft um you know the agenda for those committee meetings um and they also bring back a lot of the work that they do within the committee meeting to the wider faculty um uh during their faculty meetings every month um so you know again i think the the responsibilities that the DIB teacher leads have now is manageable. Um, and I want to make sure that they feel supported and they have that sense of direction um, that they need to take to, um, you know, advance the work uh, within their school building and feel supported not only from me, but from the admin team that is at their school. Um, so, you know, I think, again, you know, I am working, you know, I actually just ended my presentation with Thoreau, uh, uh, I think it was just last month. And they, you know, all the educators that I met with are very much, they welcome the yeah. idea of a yeah. position. I think I just need to work closely with them to better understand the scope of responsibilities and how how the role is going to fit the needs of Thoreau. And of course, we have a new principal at Thoreau. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, you know, working with him next year is going to be, it's going to be exciting to, to hear a little bit about his ideas and how this position needs to fit within, you know, his own goals, right. And the school improvement plans that, that Thoreau Angel currently is, is putting together. And of course, it's important that we get the feedback from the faculty in terms of how 
this position fits in at the row. So, right. Did you have anything else, Court? Before we went to I, would hope that, I would hope that over time you can help the school committee understand how uh, some of the work that's being done that has financial compensation and thereby a measure of extrinsic motivation mm -hmm. moves toward more of a it's everybody's business and we are intrinsically motivated to to uh, all uh, engage in it. Uh, DEIB t teacher leads may be may be unique, but I'm, I'm hoping not everything is is unique requiring uh, um, compensation, unique compensation that's DEB IB compensation. Mm -hmm. Because I think true cultural change means you, you bring it into your heart, you bring it into your mind, you bring it into your life, you bring it into your teaching. Right. Yeah, uh, I just want to respond a little bit to that. I think that's what is evolving. The DEIB leads are so impassioned about that, and it's so intrinsic in that, that they're willing to be leaders of their peers. So I don't know that I feel like they're being externally motivated. I feel like they're actually getting a chance to lead in a way that, um, you know, our structures are such that we do stipend people. They're getting like $2,000 a year. Like this, this isn't very much money. It's also avoiding us asking for other FTEs, DEIB specific FTEs, which I think would be coming if we didn't have the positions. So um, I think it's all how you frame it. I think we all have the same goals and, and the same. Do the leads mindset. do any of the professional development? Like, will they be leading workshops? at some point amongst, you know, their schools, amongst the staff, and maybe that's more what you're getting at, you know, versus outsourcing some of the PD, and will they be leading their own they PD have also? Their, they yeah, have they PD this year. Yeah. Absolutely. It's great. Yeah. Good. Um, a couple of other things. Um, do we still do exit interviews for anybody? Oh, that's, that's great you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. That was one of the items on the uh, progress monitoring spreadsheet there. Um, yes, we absolutely yeah. do exit interviews and actually knew this year we, um, you know, there was a form that, you know, any employee that was exit in our district will fill out paper, mm -hmm. paper form. We now have put that form in a Google, in a Google form um, template. And that way we're able to sort of track some of the responses, you know, it's just easier um, through Google Forms. And so, who conducts them and who uh, evaluates that information so that we HR. get some institutional learning? Yeah, HR. HR, HR and then passes along okay. as appropriate. Good. Um, uh, back to HR, you mentioned that she'll be presenting to the steering committee. Is there a way that the school committee can get access to some of those findings? Because I think those would be of yeah. value to the school committee. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Get that on the agenda. Good. All right. Uh, and finally, um, support staff data seem to be absent today. Um, is that going to be forthcoming? In terms of retention, in terms I of... I believe your, your table of the different staff groups. Um, they were embedded. They, they were, were definitely right. there. there. It seems to me that's a significant number that... Yeah. I think when you get the slides, you'll see they they're there. Yeah, pretty yeah, there. pretty much throughout. I saw faculty. I saw uh, was admin, and I think there's support. I think it was. Yeah, it's broken admin. out. Also, it's broken so. out. Can you can you pull it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he'll grab this yeah, one. Yeah. 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 Maybe I looked but didn't see support staff. So I I was looking for numbers in the column and didn't see. Them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that, and I thought that might be useful data because that's not a small number. No. Mm -hmm. So if you could add that, so we could understand mm -hmm. that, I think that'd be useful to the school committee. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and let me just look around. Uh, finally, uh, it was the uh, uh, teachers' union who uh, really uh, took some initiative on uh, saying, in effect, we want to be involved. We want to be more involved. Teachers want to be more involved. Um, uh, Dr. Hunter, maybe you can remind us, uh, to what degree did we uh, see included in the contract uh, a resumption of uh, uh, required training a la the EMI, I guess, ideas now? Right. Was that a first five years? Is that what it's got first you? five? Um, okay. I think we're having some discussion that you'll hear as we go back to the bargaining table to make it sooner than that. 
Um, so it's first five. Yeah, got yeah. it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Sarah, you've been very patient online. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, hi, hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this presentation. I'm sort of, I think, sort of following on to a couple of, of questions, comments that, that have come before. Um, sort of as a follow on to Carrie's question about, you know, it, how do we know, like, how do we, how do we understand the sentiment and all that? Um, do we, do, do we, ha I mean, we have metrics for, um, standardized test scores for enrollment and success in advanced coursework and all of that. Do we have a like a student survey, climate survey kind of thing that that can that sort of has, touches on a bunch of the questions from the equity audit to to monitor progress or 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 holes? Yeah, that's a great. great, great, great. Um, that's a great question, Sarah. Um, I am actually working with um, Dr. Paula Martin to create a belonging uh, culture climate survey. Um, I would say it's about 75% done because we really want to be intentional about the questions that we are asking. Um, and so she's essentially helping to review the questions that are on that survey. Right now it's in a it's in a Google form format. Um, but you know that that survey. I'm I'm hoping that um, in the fall that we that we do um, that we do share that survey uh, district wide, and I and and right now the the survey that I have is really focused on, um, well, it is focused on the students, but I think you can easily take the questions on the survey and apply it to our um, our educators in the district. But again, you know, we want to make sure that we are asking the right questions. Yeah, great. Okay. I mean, I can't imagine that's an easy, easy thing to frame and figure out exactly what it is, yeah. <laughs> how, how you elicit the most honest and, and useful responses, I guess, is, is I'm sure a tricky, a tricky thing. Um, and then I had a question yesterday on the PBS NewsHour. They highlighted um, this uh, these apprenticeship teacher apprenticeship programs um, that the government, the federal you know, government, is now funding. And I didn't know. They said that I think there are like 17 states that currently offer these to expand. I mean, it, it, it's something to to expand um, the you know, the net for, for possible um, incoming teachers. And is Massachusetts doing anything along these lines? Hmm. I can definitely- Not specifically that. that I know of. There's certainly a lot of initiatives coming yeah. from DESE, yeah. okay. different opportunities. Yeah. Like we said, I haven't, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, because the, yeah, the Biden administration is funding this in, I mean, now it's, but you have to be registered. I think the first you have to be registered, the state has to be registered with the, with the federal government and then the school has to be registered with the state but um, keep it was an interesting it, it, it was it was fascinating yeah, um, to, yeah, we'll certainly keep an eye out because yeah. uh dr hunter from not mistake you were having conversations earlier in the year with some local community colleges yeah, or we, or uh, umass uh yeah umass lowell yeah. we started yeah. a conversation with We've been reaching out in a number of different directions to varying degrees of impact. So um, we're taking it both from that direction and looking at, I think, our own internal pool of possible candidates who are looking to move up. So we're going to continue yeah. to reach out to the colleges. Um, the more student teachers we bring in, like all those relationships would be really important to keep growing. Uh, and then than really supporting our own folks. I will say, you know, just anecdotally, we've had, I had, I, I was able to meet a Metco alumni at the senior night the other, the other two weeks ago that's in a math educator program. And I'll tell you, Deb Jemison's almost got her signed up already to teach. So <laughs> I think really supporting and encouraging our own, our own folks and yeah. then reaching out widely is really important. That was what was really neat about that apprenticeship program mm -hmm. that they talked about yesterday. They, I mean, they started with this woman who had been a bus driver for many years, mm -hmm. loved working with kids, always mm -hmm. wanted to be a teacher, but didn't see a financial path forward to mm -hmm. achieving that. And through this apprenticeship program was able or, you know, is on the road to, to, to get in there. Um, 
So um, I think similar to that was how excited we were when the staff responded to the grant and how many of them were looking to take MTELs and things like that. And that I think has allowed us the opportunity to figure out what supports they do need. Obviously we'll hope for the fiscal package to come along with it, but I think we're in agreement that it's an important opportunity. Great, that's all, that's all I had, thanks. Thank you. I just had a couple of questions, sorry, as I keep going on. Um, you've answered a lot of them. One is the Black History course at CCHS. Is that like a year long, like a teacher meeting with students, like department head, like how, how are they developing the class? Yeah, so in the fall, um, Still, uh, 11th and 12th graders um, who sign up for the mm -hmm. course will work closely with, um, I think it's Chris Gauthier, so she says okay. teacher. Um, and so the course that's going to exist in the fall is really to um, to help create the so final it's a course. course during the school year exactly. that kids are taking to create. Oh, that's create very the cool. Black History course, create which a course. will be open okay. in which will be available to all students 2024, 2025 school year. So it can be kind of like a research exactly. seminar type class. And okay. Research. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Um, let's see. My DAB teacher leads um, the bias reporting form. So the middle school started rolling out this week. When do you see CCHS rolling out? Yeah. So I think the timeline that I have, you know, September is always so busy. And yep. so I'm aiming uh, for October. Okay that roll out and again it has to be in line with particularly for the students it has to be in line with the um bias training that we do for the ninth graders right and so i know one of the feedback that i heard this year from the ninth grade academy team is that they are hoping they're hoping to you know to have more time to get to know the students right um and so we might end up having the bias training sometime in November, similar to this year. So the academy really wants to spend September, October, really, you know, building that sense of community within within the ninth grade academy. Right. And so the timeline has shifted a little bit, but um, I think early November will, will probably be my goal. Which makes sense. The common language at the middle school of the playbook was right. such an important, critical foundation to the whole discussion. That you don't want to just roll it out and not not have right. the backdrop to it. Right. Yeah. And when you showed that pie chart on the bias mm -hmm. reports from this year, mm -hmm. how are those getting reported? Yeah, that's a great, mm -hmm. great. Um, let me just put that on the screen here. So the reports are as 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 we capture them this year are just you know students going directly. To teachers to teachers or um again to your point a trusted adult to school um admin team that are exists in the buildings and you know and then the admin team is informing me of what those incidents are okay so we've been able to capture um for the most part almost all the incidents that have occurred this year okay that's great i think i had one more question before we just look um Oh, are there bias reporting form posters? Like you had that QR code on there. Like, are there going to be posters in the building? Because, you yeah. know, kids are just on their phones. So will they just. Yeah, I am out? actually, if you look back on, I think I might have said something on one of these slides. Um, I, I have located a vendor. Okay. <laughs> and so I have a budget that I am, I am working with. Okay. Uh, we will have, you know, so for the protocol, we are going to make, you know, laminated copies of it. And I think they're going to go, we haven't really talked through this a lot, but I'm hoping that we put those in, you know, high traffic areas. Yeah. So like, you know, the, the, the student services, uh, so student support services office, where all of our guidance counselors are at, obviously the main office, and it will be available for any teacher um, to have the protocol displayed in their classroom. Okay. In addition to that, we will have uh, the, QR code that students can scan um, that will bring them directly to the form that will be made available to anyone. We can post it in classrooms. I mean, anywhere really, right? Um, agenda books, students can have yeah, the, yeah. the agenda right. books and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'm, I just literally, I think it was just yesterday that I, I located a vendor that we have actually used in the past 
that the Black Student Union actually used two years ago to create their stickers. Um, and so working on that now. Okay. Well, this was excellent. I mean, very thorough. The, I mean, thank you for the tremendous amount of work that you've really, you know, poured into this. I think, you know, even two years ago when this kind of when you stepped into the role, I mean, this, you really developed it into something that has been amazing for us. You are getting, you know, praise all over town. I, I listened to this morning, Joe Palumbo, really, you know, he is great. And he really talked about how far ahead the schools really are. And he's really looking forward to, you know, working with you to kind of bring some of that to the town level. So, you know, I think we really appreciate all the work that's gone into this and you have definitely built, you know, a department. I heard that, you know, when I was, I wasn't even on school committee and people were looking for a department mm -hmm. and it feels like we have a department yeah. um, just with, with our current staff that's here. Um, and to court's point, you know, with those DEIB, lead, yeah. DEIB leads and all of that, it does create the feel of a robust department. Yeah. And, you know, I, I will just end by, you know, to court's point earlier, this work is everyone's business. Right. And I intentionally use the word coalition. Right. Because yeah. that's what it feels like to me. Right. When you have this level of support and engagement and commitment, that's what it feels like. Right. That you have a coalition and it's not just the schools. Right. It is the community doing this work. And so um, I think it's, it's important that that we continue to um, have that be the narrative. Um, right. So, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Well, before we adjourn, um, I'm going to break our protocol a little bit. We, we have, we have um, I think we have one person with a hand up for public comment. So we typically do public comment at the beginning of our meeting and I never open it up at the end, but I will open it up at the end because I think there was technical difficulty also. So thank you for joining us. If you can state your name and address and just before you go, I'll just give you my speech of you have three minutes. This is a meeting in the public, but not with the public. So we won't be making any comments. Um, and you can go right ahead, Rob Monroe. I appreciate that. And I apologize for the breaking the protocol here, but I'm grateful for the allowance. Um, Rob Monroe, 1400 Lower Road here in Concord. Um, just want to start off by saying and re repeating everything that folks have said, um, giving praise and, and shout out to you, Andrew and, and Dr. Hunter for the amazing work you guys are doing um, as a community member and hopefully a member of this coalition um, you, you speak of, Andrew, it's it's humbling and also really affirming to, to see the work you guys are doing in the interest of the students um, and the adults here. Um, I'm here to represent a, a voice that's been increasingly loud and hopefully one that's in, increasingly supportive of the work that's going on. Um, with uh, with the new middle school, and you know there have been, there have been seven hundred or so folks who have signed a petition to um, name that middle school the Ellen Garrison Jackson Middle School. Um, you know the the, the time is in incredibly acute to to do that in honor of really one of the most celeb you know underserved but celebrated educators in Concord's history on her 200th birthday, someone who represents every single value that was not only talked about today, but um, value that's represented in the unveiling of this middle school. Um, and I, I know that the, the school board has the the prerogative to, to name schools, and I would, I would simply request and um, that the school committee with the superintendent look very hard into the naming of the school. You know, many students and adults and community members of color recognize that this DEIB work happens with places and faces um, and the two build off one another. And so I think recognizing this place as a, a monument for Ellen Garrison Jackson and the work she did to advance education, not only for black folks, but also for folks in and around the Concord area and beyond is not only uh, a testament to her great work and the work that you guys are all doing, but it's really the community's work. And so as we advance um, the voices and narratives of our Metco families in our increasingly diverse town, to me, this is a no brainer. Um, and I I wanna thank you guys for for taking this seriously and, and for truly thinking it through, because I think it's an amazing opportunity and one that we don't want to let go by. Thank you. Thank you. 
And with that, um, I will adjourn the Concord Carlo Regional School Committee. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Andrew, thank you. Laurie, thank you. Yeah, very Absolutely. Nice. Thank you.